Hey lifers, Dustin here, and today is a very somber day for college football fans all across the world. Today is the first day of the offseason. You see, last night we crowned a brand new national champion. Congratulations to the Clemson Tigers. And today is the official start to there not being more college football games. So I decided that on my very first Tuesday after the national championship, I would not take a look forward and not take a look backwards, but kind of do both at the exact same time and address some issues that I think the NCAA needs to look at in the offseason for rules that I wish they would implement during the next upcoming season. Now, there's a lot wrong with the NCAA, and I'm doing this in part to hear what some of your gripes and concerns are about this flawed yet wonderful organization that we all subscribe to and follow and love, and they give us a lot of things, but they could do better. Here are the top 10 things that the NCAA should change before the 2017 college football season, in my humble opinion. As I'm going through this list, I want you to let me know down in the comments section things you would change, but let's get started with number 10. Pass interference. When I played high school football, the three games that I played high school football, when the coaches were talking to us when we were on the defensive side, they said that if a wide receiver, a tight end, or a running back was breaking and you had to cover him, and he was wide open and was going to score a touchdown, just tackle him. Tackle him before he gets the ball, shove him out of bounds, trip him up, do whatever you have to. One, because I didn't probably go to the best high school. And two, so he could not catch the touchdown. Because a pass interference call is, a, is not a spot foul, rather. It is from the line of scrimmage. That is the same way it is in college, and that's something that has to change. It's already like this in the pros, and for very good reason. Like I said, if somebody's running down the field, if you throw 80 yards down the field and somebody just shoves the receiver at the last second, that's 15-yard penalty. It's not an 80-yard penalty. We all agree there's a lot of ticky-tacky pass interference calls that are called on the defense. There's a lot that are not called on the offense. And I think this could cut down on some of those problems because... Instead of being really aggressive because you know it's just 15 yards instead of getting beat, it would be a spot foul. So if you threw it 50 yards down the field from your own 20, now you're in field goal range instead of at the 35. This could hopefully cut down a lot of the ticky-tacky calls down the field. And of course, you could always train your refs. You could practice with them so they could be able to see what is and what is not pass interference more clearly. I think it's kind of becoming what a foul is in basketball. Sometimes it's a foul, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's a stupid call, sometimes it's perfectly fine and they let it go for some reason. And I don't really want that to water down the product because there are certain teams where literally an offensive game plan is to throw it down the field, get the defensive backs to get some kind of a penalty and you move the ball that way. I saw Pitt do that pretty effectively against Clemson earlier this year as well as Georgia Tech. Also, one little thing that has bugged me since I was a little kid if the guy catches the ball, it's not pass interference. Wave the penalty. Clearly he didn't interfere with the pass. Dude caught it. Number nine, spring games. If there is one thing, genuinely, I do not care about in college football, it's spring games. It's a practice. That's all it is. It's a very basic practice. They're not showing any real plays. You may see an occasional burst of athleticism from a freshman or a JUCO recruit, but for the most part, it's just practice. You're just sitting in the sun and the hot watching practice when I can just watch it on TV or see the highlights later on on television. Also, it's the 21st century. I could see it on the internet. I could see it on this thing. What I think would make spring games infinitely more interesting, make it like a game against another team. A lot of people are probably going to scoff at this idea at first, but the NFL already does it. First off, they have actual exhibition games, while college football notoriously doesn't. And yes, this is five months out from the season, so it's not a true exhibition game, but it's more competition than these players will see any time between January and September. The NFL also does a very interesting thing during training camp where, say, the Falcons and Redskins are playing their second preseason game against each other, and say that the game is in Atlanta. Well, the Redskins may come down two or three days early and have one or two scrimmages against the Falcons before they go into the game. So this is something the NFL already does. I think this would make college football infinitely better as far as preseason games, the spring games go. I think the best way to do this would be a neutral site or a home-and-home, -home, kind of like you do with regular scheduling. And it would be best if it was kept within the region. So teams like Tennessee and Clemson or Virginia Tech and Penn State... 
A big key in this is don't make it mandatory, make it possible. If two teams agree to do this, let them do it. I think it would be fine. You could even charge a little bit for fans to come in. Not $90, but I think fans would pay $20 to watch, you know, West Virginia and Michigan go up against each other. Also, for people like Jim Harbaugh who want to travel around the country, if Michigan decided to do this against, say, Florida State, they could do it in Florida at Tampa or Orlando or something, and all of a sudden they get to do their traveling camp down in Florida. Yes, I know there is a higher risk for injury, but honestly, that's the way it is anytime you step on the field, whether it's for practice, the weight room, which isn't a field, but you know what I'm saying, whether it be practice or scrimmages or games, it's just the way it is. It comes with the sport, and if you don't want to do that, then don't schedule your team to go against these competitors. But in my humble opinion, iron sharpens iron, and I think the best way for some of these teams to get better during the offseason is to have an opponent during the offseason. Number eight, early signing periods. Now this seems to be an issue that people are really torn on. As of right now, players, and correct me if I'm wrong, because there's a chance I am, players cannot officially sign their letter of intent until the first Wednesday in February. Now, what this rule would propose is two 72-hour extended periods, the last Wednesday in June and sometime in mid-December, which is when JUCO players can sign their letter of intent. Now, in my opinion, if they enacted this, and this is something that's being heavily debated right now by the NCAA, there's proponents on both sides of the equation, I think it could alleviate some of the recruiting on some of the players who have already made their decisions. There's some kids that grew up wanting to be a Florida Gators fan. They're going to Florida, no matter what you do. Tim Tebow was never going to another school. He was going to be a Florida Gator. So instead of continuously recruiting him, just let him sign. And then maybe sometimes that can help transition into an early enrollment. But just let him sign. If he's that sure, if the coaching staff is fine with him, let him sign. This can also reallocate time and resources to other players that the coaches are going after to expand their footprint a little bit. If they're focusing so much on, say, a kid in Tampa and a kid in Chicago, and both of them are locks, they definitely want to go, you still have to keep recruiting that kid because you don't want LSU to come in at the last second and sweep him away. Well, if he signed his letter of intent, you don't have to really worry about him. You can keep in casual contact with him. But now you can go after that player in Dallas that you may not have the resources for because you're flying between Tampa and Chicago and, I don't know, Maryland. And now you can go out to Dallas because you have a little bit more resources at your disposal. This could also give coaches a very much needed time off. They have literally no vacation because they're always either recruiting or in the season. Now, the entire idea of recruiting is this wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey thing. It's this unbreakable, complex equation, and there's a lot of little tweaks and big adjustments that you can make. Let me know down below some of the ones you would make to recruiting as well. Number seven, overtime. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say real quick, this is a safe one for me. I think the college overtime rule is very well done. I think both teams get equal chances equal starting field position both teams get the ball it's not confusing like the NFL rule where well if you score a touchdown it's over if you score a field goal then we get the ball but if we score a field goal it keeps no 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 no, no. you get the ball but instead of the 25 you move the original line of scrimmage back to the 40 now teams have to get a first down to get in most college kicker hashtag college kickers range for an actual field goal try it makes it just a little bit better. I think just moving it back from the 25 to the 40 would do wonders. It would cut down on some of those five and six overtime games. And honestly, this is something that the NFL should really adopt as well. Number six, an extra, extra point. About a month and a half ago, after the Ravens' 1914 victory over the Bengals, Ravens kicker Justin Tucker suggested kind of seriously to the media that if the kicker on the kickoff can get the ball through the goalpost that the team that kicked off should get an extra point. Coach John Harbaugh agreed. Now part of that is because Tucker does that pretty regularly. He has one of the strongest legs in the NFL. But it got me thinking. That is something that I could really get on board with. Now hear me out. I don't know the last time that college football changed a scoring rule. It may have been like the 60s when they last changed what a point total is for a certain play. But I think this makes a lot of sense. First off, 
everybody in the higher ups of sports in general, but especially football, pretend they care about player safety. I tend to think they care more about money, but they say they care about player safety. Well, if you care about player safety and you want to get rid of kickoffs in general, which is something that has been proposed, why don't you just give the kickers an extra incentive to kick it really, really hard and out of the end zone? They already tried where if you get a touchback, the offense starts at the 25 instead of the 20. This to me is just the next natural evolution of that. Just give them an extra point. Whenever somebody does a kickoff and it goes to the uprights, we all do the touchdown, it's good symbol anyway. I also think this would give a lot more weight to those plays and penalties that happen on extra points and touchdowns because if you can assess it on the kickoff, then all of a sudden you could be kicking off from the 50 and that is a real chance to get an extra point and it could change the entire dynamic of a game. Imagine you go for two and you're up by eight and then the team that's about to receive has a dead ball personal foul penalty. Now you get it through the uprights, you're up by nine and it's a two score game. Another theory that has been suggested, I think also by Tucker in that same interview, was if you don't like the idea of a point differential, if the kicker kicks it through the uprights on his kickoff, maybe the offense starts at the 10 yard line. I mean, the field goals are already there. We might as well use them on kickoffs. Number five, kicking tees. Since we're already talking about kickers, let's stay on the topic and let me bring this up. I think we should get rid of kicking tees on kickoffs. Now, this is not ever going to happen because of the last thing I said. They're pretending to care about player safety, and in order to do that, they want more touchbacks. Well, kicking a kickoff off a kicking tee ensures you're going to have more touchbacks than if somebody holds the ball. But I think another player holding the ball will make it more interesting. I think it would be harder to predict on the kicks, theoretically. You know, sometimes they'll lean it one way or the other. I think it would make onside kicks a little easier, maybe. I think that the chances of a kick going out of bounds would increase, which would give better starting position to the receiving team. Also, I really hate it when the football gets blown over on windy days and we have to try them running past the football three times. That gets pretty annoying. Also, I know it's probably never happened, not that I've ever heard of, but every time there's a tee on the field, I just expect somebody to get tackled or thrown on top of it. And I did that when I was in Pee Wee and it didn't feel good. Besides, we already got rid of kicking tees on field goals in 1989 because the theory was if another player was holding the ball instead of it just being on a kicking tee, that it would make field goals and extra points more exciting. And for the most part, they have. I know there's still a high percentage play, but there's still been some big missed extra points and especially big missed field goals that if they would have had the kicking tee probably would have gone through. Number four, less bowl games. Being really good and getting to a, a postseason bowl game used to matter. It used to mean something that if, you know, you won two-thirds of your games and you get to go to an exotic location and get free stuff and play another quality team and everyone watched all these bowl games and it mattered. Now, there's so many bowl games that literally two-thirds of the teams are penciled in to play in a bowl game every single year. Real prestigious. In 2015, 80 bowl eligible, meaning at least six win teams, were needed to fill the bowl spots. They only got 77. This year, still needing 80, they got 75. There are too many bowl games, and if we're being honest, nobody really starts caring until it's like December 29th. For the most part, that first week, week and a half of bowl games is scrapped. A lot of people watch it because it's on. They don't really care unless, of course, you are a member of the MAC or the CUSA, or you have a rooting interest for the team, but the nation in general doesn't really care about those games too much, and I think it's mostly lost revenue as far as viewership goes. Now, this is not going to happen because ESPN in particular makes so much money from the ads and the sponsors of these games, and they bring too much money to local economies to get rid of them would really kill Boca Raton in December. If I'm being honest, I, I just made up Boca Raton. I have no idea what their economy is in December. In my opinion, we need to go to 20 to 25 bowl games and make the cutoff eight wins instead of six, and then we use the highest APR from the last two years, I think is how they do it, for the best seven and five teams instead of the best five and seven teams. That way you have to have a winning record in order to get into the game, and none of this beating two FCS team bullcrap. There's just absolutely no reason that losing teams who even if they win the bowl game are still going to be losing teams should play in a bowl game. It's just my opinion. Number three, player transfers. As far as I know, 
If I, as a student, would like to transfer from the University of Alabama to Clemson University during in between two semesters, I'm free to do that as long as I meet all the eligibility requirements and can pay for it. Then, after that year, say I wanted to move to Oklahoma State, I really, as far as I know, have the right to do that. So why don't players? Now, technically, players can transfer around as much as they want. Look at Luke Del Rio. But they have to either drop down to the JUCO or FCS levels or sit out a year of competition. Why? If they genuinely meet the GPA requirement, and I know that schools can fudge that if there's a recruit they really want. And by recruit, I mean student-athlete already. It's not really a recruit anymore. But if there's a football player they want, they can fudge the numbers. But that's theoretically why you have the NCAA regulatory board and you have bylaws to protect against that. And if they find out about that, they sanction you. What if we made it to where a player could only transfer twice in his collegiate term? So we could go to three different teams total. Three teams in four years doesn't seem so bad. Or what if they declare in their letter of intent the coach or two coaches that really pursued their heart. That sounded weird. The two coaches who really were the ones that drove home that they needed to come to USC. And they are the reasons why they are at USC. And then if one or both of those coaches leave, they get released if they want to from their letter of intent from their scholarship and they can go to wherever that coach is. If you're a freshman at the University of Texas and you formed a really strong bond with Charlie Strong, no pun intended, now you're screwed. You're at Texas and he's off at USF. And if, you, if he was the reason you became a Longhorn, he probably would be the reason you would want to be a Bull as well. Now, for the record, I've heard a proposed idea for a one-year scholarship between the player and the school that would kind of help to fix this. I don't like that because, say, a player goes to, what's a good example, goes to UCLA, right? And UCLA, all of a sudden, Washington. Washington's a better example. Say they go to Washington with Chris Peterson's first or second class. And then Washington gets really good, and this player just isn't up to snuff. He has, and his family believes in him, that he has a full ride to the University of Washington. And he's proud, and he's going to be an alum, and he's going to graduate, and he can't afford college, and he's not that great. And now Washington's better than they were when he got there. And now Chris Peterson and the staff decide, well... You, you're a fine person, but you're not that great of a safety, and instead we're going to bring in this four- or five-star safety, so we're not going to renew your scholarship. That's how I see that ended up being abused, especially at the higher levels of college football. I also would not want players at Oregon to talk to players at Michigan and try to convince them to come to Oregon. That should be absolutely outlawed against every NCAA law. Once a player signs a letter of intent, he should be not eligible to be talked to by any other team until he formally announces that he is leaving a program. Then he becomes a free agent, kind of like they already are when they go to JUCO. I don't know. I think it's a pretty complicated issue. Let me know what you think down below in the comment section, as well as probably the most controversial thing in college football right now and that is my number two paying players i think for these top two options i may end up making entire videos about them looking kind of at the pros and the cons of each piece so i, I won't go into a whole lot of detail here let me know down below if you think that that would be something you'd be interested in but i am for paying players now, I know a lot of people really hate this idea, and honestly, I really hated this idea until I went to college. Because once I was in college, I was hungry. Here's my proposed plan for paying players. I, I know players aren't hungry, by the way. They get all their meals for free. They get everything for free. And that's been the big argument for people who were against pay for play is, well, they already get paid by getting a free tuition, free textbooks, and all that stuff. And I say, that's fine. But I knew athletes in college, uh, not a whole lot of football players on like a personal basis, but I knew a lot of women's soccer players and rowers and basketball players and soccer players. And some of these kids, because they're 18 or 19, they can't get a job. They can't go and make money because they have such a strict practice routine or you know, their, their academic schedule is set up for them pretty much around training and workouts and practice. They can't go and get a job to get money. So what do they do? What if they come from a really, really poor town or a poor family and they can't get things? 
Well, it's illegal for boosters to give them money. That's something that'll get the whole program shut down, right? You can't do that. People at the school can't do it because that's against NCAA regulations. Are they supposed to get it from their friends? Well, their friends are college students. What are they supposed to do? What if they want to take a girl on a date? They don't have any money to do that. It goes beyond just being able to eat on campus. Sometimes you just want to go for a joyride. You don't have gas to put in your car. Sometimes you want to take a girl on a date. Or when you get a little bit older, just have a boys night. But you can't. You can't go out and have fun. You can't go to restaurants because you don't have money. In a lot of these cases. And again, I'm not just talking about football. And yes, I know even though there's no pay for play at a lot of these top colleges... They get benefits, they get scooters, they get cars, they get cash under the table, they get, you know, money up front, they end up having to pay for people. But then you also have people like Terrell Pryor who have to sell jewelry in order to get things. Tattoos are not exactly a necessity, but if he had a job, theoretically, or some kind of way to get cash, he could have paid for that himself. Now, I went to the University of Alabama, and I can tell you at Bama we had something called an ACT card. Now, what an ACT card was is our student ID, and on that student ID we had something called Bama Cash. And that Bama Cash could be used at specific places. So, some grocery stores, there's a Publix on campus, some restaurants, some bars that you couldn't buy alcohol, uh, convenience stores that were in and around campus... And in those places, you could use Bama Cash. So if you wanted to go to Mugshots and get a hamburger, you could use Bama Cash. So what I suggest is that the schools agree on a flat fee to give to all athletes, regardless of whether they're football or rowing or basketball or whatever. They get the same amount, 3000 3, a semester or 3000 a year, whatever it is they decide to do. I know this is going to hurt a lot of programs because this is going to come out of their athletic budget. And if you have to pay three grand for each player on a football team that's scholarshiped, 85 times 3,000 is a lot of money. And that's just one program. And I understand that. But at the same time, if you can't afford to have them there, why do you have them there? If you can't afford to fully give them a full college experience and fully help them out, why are they there? They generate so much money for the university. I have, I, I could look it up. I can only imagine how much those football players have generated for the University of Alabama since Nick Saban got there and began building his dynasty. I can only imagine. I was there when Nick Saban was there. He built the entire north side of that campus. Anybody familiar with Alabama, all the Ridgecrest communities, all the new ones, he built all of that stuff. He helped build Shelby Hall. He helped build so much because of the money that came from the athletic department, some of which got funneled into the academic budget. I'm talking billions of dollars. Now, the downside of this is that FAU, for instance, can't afford the same thing Alabama can afford. I understand that. That's why it would have to be some agreed upon flat fee. This is something that I need to research more and get more into, but I, I do feel like these kids should be paid based on what they bring in. And what they bring in is billions of dollars. The men's basketball tournament brings in so much money. I don't know. Let me know what you think about it in the comments section. A lot of you I know are gonna think it's a terrible idea and that's perfectly fine. Don't yell at me, let's just have a nice conversation. And number one, an eight team playoff. Now, I honestly don't think this is that controversial. There are some people that like it at four teams. There's some people that want it at six. There's some people who want it at 16, but I like eight. In 2016, do you really think that four teams is enough to crown a true national champion? Truly the best team in the nation. You don't think Penn State deserved a shot? You don't think USC deserved a shot? You don't think Wisconsin deserved a shot just because they lost a game that was extra because they won other games? I think the eight-team format is perfect. I talked about it in a game last year. I'm going to have an eight-team 2016 scenario video coming out soon, I think. But basically, if there was eight teams this year, can you imagine some of the games? Are you telling me you're 100% certain that USC wouldn't have beaten Clemson or Alabama or Ohio State? They beat Penn State. Penn State beat Ohio State. We could very well be sitting here right now with USC as the new national champion, but because it was limited to four teams and two of those games were essentially blowouts, we never really knew. In 2014, Baylor and TCU deserved just as much of a shot to play for the national championship as Ohio State did. In 2015, one loss Michigan State beat undefeated Iowa on like the last drive of the Big Ten championship, yet Iowa got left out. 
Why? They were undefeated the entire regular season. They lost in an extra game. Why should they be penalized for that? They should be at 18 playoff and they should get in. This year, it was USC and Penn State. Those teams, Michigan, these teams deserve to get in. There will always be the argument that, well, if we expand to eight, the ninth team is going to be upset. If we expand to 16, well, then the 17th team is going to be upset. Yeah, of course they are. They were one spot away in a very arbitrary way from playing for a national championship. But if the ninth team gets left out, I'm a little more okay with that than the fifth team. Remember when there was just the BCS and we were yelling about the third team being left out? To me, it's the exact same thing. If we were in the BCS in the last two years, Alabama and Clemson would have played for the national championship, just like they did. Introducing a little bit more teams, one more round of games, I don't think it hurt. I think it would help boost the ratings. You could push back the national championship game one more week until Martin Luther King Day or Martin Luther King Weekend, depending. I know that's a national holiday, so that may get kind of weird. But sometime in that time frame, because we were going to have the NFL until the Super Bowl is over in February anyway. So you might as well kind of push it back a little bit. Think of it this way. If you get a top eight, you're not even in the top 10% of teams in the country. So there's no way you can tell me without a shout of a doubt, they are the best team in the country. I just won't believe it until we have at least eight teams. That's just the way I feel about it. So those are all the things that I would change before the next season. Obviously, pretty much none of them, maybe one or two, will get changed. Really, this is more of a five-year plan, a five-year outlook, especially when it comes to the 18 playoff. Let me know down below what things you would change about the greatest sport in the world in college football. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. I'm sure there's a lot of things that I didn't talk about or didn't get into enough. And you may even change my opinion based on a different way you think or talk about it. So please make sure to let me know. Thank y'all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up. You can also click the circle right there with the championship trophy, that ugly trophy, which would be another thing I would change in order to subscribe or check out other videos over here. Thank you guys, and as always, until next time played high school football when the coaches were talking to us when we were on the defensive side they said that if a wide receiver a tight end or running back was breaking and you had to cover him and he was wide open and was going to score a touchdown just tackle him tackle him before he gets the ball shove him out of bounds trip him up do whatever you have to one because i didn't probably go to the best high school and two so he could not catch the touchdown because a pass interference call is a is not a spot foul rather it is from the line of scrimmage that is the same way it is in college and that's something that has to change it's already like this in the pros and for very good reason practice with them so they could be able to see what is and what is not pass interference more clearly i think it's kind of becoming what a foul is in basketball Sometimes it's a foul, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's a stupid call, sometimes it's perfectly fine and they let it go for some reason. And I don't really want that to water down the product because there are certain teams where literally an offensive game plan is to throw it down the field, get the defensive backs to get some kind of a penalty and you move the ball that way. I saw Pitt do that pretty effectively against Clemson earlier this year as well as Georgia Tech. Also, one little thing that has bugged me since I was a little kid if the guy catches the ball, it's not I wish they would implement during the next upcoming season. Now, there's a lot wrong with the NCAA, and I'm doing this in part to hear what some of your gripes and concerns are about this flawed yet wonderful organization that we all subscribe to and follow and love, and they give us a lot of things, but they could do better. Here are the top 10 things that the NCAA should change before the 2017 college football season in my humble opinion. As I'm going through this list, I want you to let me know down in the comments section things you would change, but let's get started with number 10. Pass interference. When I played high school football, the three games that I, like I said, if somebody's running down the field, if you throw 80 yards down the field and somebody just shoves the receiver at the last second, that's 15 yard penalty. It's not an 80 yard penalty. We all agree there's a lot of ticky tacky pass interference calls that are called on the defense. There's a lot that are not called on the offense. And I think this could cut down on some of those problems because instead of being really aggressive because you know it's just 15 yards instead of getting beat, it would be a spot foul. So if you threw it 50 yards down the field from your own 20, now you're in field goal range instead of at the 35. This could hopefully cut down a lot of the ticky-tacky calls down the field. And of course, you could always train your refs. You could practice. 
Hey lifers, Dustin here, and today is a very somber day for college football fans all across the world. Today is the first day of the offseason. You see, last night we crowned a brand new national champion. Congratulations to the Clemson Tigers. And today is the official start to there not being more college football games. So I decided that on my very first Tuesday after the national championship, I would not take a look forward and not take a look backwards, but kind of do both at the exact same time and address some issues that I think the NCAA needs to look at in the offseason for rules that 